Well, welcome everyone to our fifth and final session on First Peter. We've been working through the book, uh, through Peter's first letter, looking at a different chapter each week. Uh, so we're on chapter five, the final chapter of First Peter. So if you haven't uh, read it before this session, you might want to uh, pause the video at this point and, uh, and read it to yourself before you begin. Um, as we get to this last chapter, we'll see that uh, Peter concludes his letter with a kind of a charge to Christians, uh, his final charge, you could say, and he, he addresses different groups, really very much focused on uh, the leadership within the church, balancing instructions on how to live together as Christians, uh, also with how to live in the world, as he's been doing, uh, going sort of back and forth between those two throughout the letter. Uh, one commentator says that in contrast to the household codes, which is what we were looking at in the last couple of sessions, he begins here with the responsibilities of those in authority, rather than uh, those who, um, rather than of those who owe to them deference or submission, and that the weight of emphasis falls on that charge to those in authority rather than those receiving their authority. So we're going to go through, this is a slightly shorter chapter than others, but we're going to uh, break it up a little bit unevenly but, um, in terms of the number of verses, but just to, just to go with the topic. So Randy, we've just got Randy joining us today. If you could read for us, please, the first five verses, just verses one to five. Thank you. One through five. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Thank you very much. So uh, before we get into the passage in detail, um, most translations, I think, will have something like um, the word then or so right at the very beginning. This is a little particle in Greek that's just connecting what he's been talking about in the previous chapter with what he's going to be talking about now. So, so in the light of what I've just told you, talking about sufferings for Christ, talking about Christ's sufferings on our behalf, which he's, he's talked about a number of times. So in the light of that, he says... Um, and then he picks up immediately on that theme of suffering, talking about being a, a, a witness of the sufferings of Christ. And these first four verses, he talks to those he calls elders. We'll talk a bit about what, who that might be um, as we go along. And then he talks to those who literally are the youngest, the younger ones, um, which he's going to, uh, which again, we'll, we'll look at together. So I'm going to look, look at, uh, open a slideshow now and uh, share my screen. So as we look at this uh, together and we think about the opening here, how does <clears throat> Peter has, um, at the very beginning of the letter, Peter introduced himself. He talked about himself as an apostle and he talked about where he was, uh, he talked about where the church was that he's writing to. But how does uh, Peter describe himself and his ministry in this, uh, particularly in verse one? So. Uh, I'm going to be going back and forth a bit just with Randy this evening as there's just the two of us. So how does he seem to talk about himself and his ministry here? Well, he says two things about himself. He, he says that he is a fellow elder. Um, so the people that he's talking to, he's identifying with. Mm. And then he says that he's a witness of Christ's suffering. Actually, three things. And then one who will also share in the glory to be revealed. So kind of a threefold description there. Yeah, it's very, uh, very interesting, isn't it? Um, as Randy was saying, we already know that he calls himself an apostle. He's, he's used that uh, self-descriptor in the first 
uh, verse of the first chapter, the very beginning of the letter. So he's not shy about that. But here, as Randy was saying, he's identifying himself with the rest of the leaders in what you might call a, a very humble way. So he's, even though they might say they're under him, uh, he's writing to them as their kind of spiritual leader. Nevertheless, he's identifying himself with them. He calls himself a, a fellow elder, a co-elder. Um, we have this word in Greek, or we have this sort of um, uh, preposition, which we sometimes find joined uh, to other verbs or other words that means sort of together with. And so it's like the together with, the fellow, we say in English, fellow elder. And it's actually all governed by one, um, by the, the the, we might say, the definite article, um, where he says uh, the witness, the, the fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ. So although we might be, um, we might imagine that Peter is talking about purely about himself as a witness of the sufferings of Christ, um, it's probably something a little different in that if he's including the elders, it seems to be that it's, this is joined as one group here grammatically. They obviously uh, weren't eyewitnesses of the sufferings of Christ. And in some ways, if we're talking about the crucifixion, neither was Peter, because Peter, as we know, um, denied Jesus. He ran away, he hid, he fled. Um, so he wasn't around. So it seems to me more like the sense in which Peter uh, talks about um, those things that have been testified beforehand in the, in the first chapter, in verse 11, where it's more like a fellow witness of the message itself. So a, a fellow witness of that uh, message about the sufferings of Christ. But again, we notice that Peter's very quick to talk about suffering as he does elsewhere in the letter. Um, so as Randy said, he's that, um, the sufferings of Christ and a partaker, uh, one who is going to be a sharer in um, the, uh, and again, it's using the word that's uh, used for sort of fellowship. We use in other contexts of fellowship, sharing in the glory to be revealed. And again, that's another common theme, isn't it? We've seen in, um, in First Peter that something's going to be revealed something is going to and a lot of emphasis on glory that's the interesting thing actually we get in this letter isn't it we have a lot of um, stress on suffering but also a lot of stress on glory the two going together just as perhaps we might say in Paul's letters we get a certain amount of stress on both uh, Jesus cross his death but also his resurrection so he talks about the elders. I exhort, I urge the elders. So the question is, who are the elders? And this is kind of a rhetorical question. I'm going to just talk about that with you now. So who, what does he mean when we talk about the elders? In our own context, we can have very, um, our ideas can be conditioned by what our experiences have been in, in churches. So um, let me just say something about church leadership. We have some churches, um, do we use the word elders in you hope we do yeah um, so, no no not at new no, we don't. but no, um, okay. many of the churches that we come from most of them actually right. do use the word elders yes yes so a lot of um what you might call more congregational churches of which new hope would be one um sort of independent churches would have an elder kind of system even if they don't use the actual word elder then we have Presbyterians who are something else again in terms of leadership. We won't get into that. But, uh, but the funny thing is the word um, that we're using, pres presbyter, <laughs> ironically does come from the word elder, although Presbyterians have a slightly different model of government that includes other churches, not just their own church. And then we have um, uh, other denominations. These tend to be the more traditional denominations. Um, so uh, the historic groupings before the Reformation and those that came out sort of immediately out of the Reformation or those that came out of them that are what you might call Episcopalian. Now in the United States when we think of the word Episcopalian we probably think of one denomination, the Episcopalian church, but um, Episcopalian is really just describing a form of church government where there is someone who is, we would tend to use the term bishop these days but not exclusively, bishop who is uh, at the top of a pyramid, if you like. So it might be a bishop over a large region of churches, sometimes called a diocese in the Anglican or Episcopal church or Catholic church. The Lutherans talk about a synod, um, but it will be a large area of churches governed by a leader uh, who they would call a bishop. And sometimes we might have an overall uh, bishop, a bishop of bishops, who we might call the archbishop, or in the United States, they're called the presiding bishop in the Episcopal church. 
So the, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Catholic Church, the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church worldwide, which the Episcopal Church is part of. Also, um, most of the Methodist churches, the Lutheran Church, of course, um, I think Moravian Church, other churches will have bishops, overseers. And it's tempting sometimes to look for a kind of a blueprint in the New Testament. And each group in some ways can sometimes try to claim a, a blueprint, say, well, we're following the New Testament church uh, model of government, whether we're Baptist or Anglican. So who are the elders? Well, uh, this term elders, of course, was around predating um, Christianity. It's used in the Old Testament sometimes for the elders of, Israel, the, elders of the people of Israel. Uh, it's used in secular settings, but just to focus on the New Testament for the sake of time. Um, in Acts, uh, Paul refers to the elders of the church at the light. It's in Acts 20 when Paul gives his address to these, what we call the Ephesian elders. Um, Acts 15 and 16, where we have the Jerusalem Council, which, does, which decides um, the outcome of the, the fate, if you like, of the Gentile Christians. Are they supposed to be circumcised? Can they be accepted just as they are? Um, that, in that council, it speaks uh, four times out of the six times that elders are referred to. It talks about the apostles and the elders, as if there's some kind of connection, the apostles and the elders. Then as we get into what we often call the pastoral epistles, which are those three letters written by Paul to church leaders who were kind of his associates or his, his juniors in ministry. So the two letters to Timothy and the one to Titus frequently uses this term elders, which again in the Greek comes from the, this word that we use for presbyter, uh, which is also sometimes used for people who've been ordained a presbyter. Um, so it seems to be used quite a bit uh, more so with a connotation of office, that they've got a particular role in the life of the church. In fact, at one place, Timothy, uh, I mean, Paul in 1 Timothy 5 verse 7, I put the reference there, talks about the elders who rule. And interestingly, <clears throat> in Titus, we have a reference, a couple of references to elders who, uh, in verse 5 and then in verse 7 of chapter 1, it's clear that these are the elders who who, who oversee the work and the term for oversee uh, the, the verb for overseeing is from the same family as the noun for overseer which we often translate bishop because in our contemporary um, church, church tradition where we do things we've often had a separation between okay we have episcopalians here talking about church government the older denominations who have bishops and then in our congregational or baptist or pentecostal models we might have elders but there we have in the New Testament elders who are also, you might say, doing bishop things. <laughs> so it's the, modders, the, the waters are more kind of muddied than it might appear uh, today. As I said, um, this word from which we get our word uh, episcopal, so episkopos in Greek, bishop. Um, again, bishop is a sort of a churchy connotation, so it might be better to just say overseer because of the baggage that goes with our modern conceptions of bishop. That phrase appears um, actually in the plural in Acts and Philippians, um, perhaps rather than thinking of one, so that might have raised the question of whether there were there multiple overseers for one church, whereas we think of that word bishop as an overseer over multiple churches. But it's used in, in the singular in the pastoral epistles as well. So, so who are these elders? Who are these people? Well, one uh, academic study that was went in, into great depth in this argued that elders probably in the New Testament context refer to the status of heads of households. So households where the church is met, as you know, the church is met, the New Testament churches of Paul's day and Peter's day met, if not exclusively, uh, the majority of them, it seems met in houses, ordinary houses, they didn't have church buildings and they were hosted. And we sometimes hear about people who hosted them like Priscilla and Aquila, a famous couple we mentioned in our study in Philippians and other people mentioned in Romans 16, 1 Corinthians 16, etc. Um, so it could be that those were sort of household, uh, heads of the household, people with senior status uh, in the early house churches. But it's hard to be sure of the exact relationship between them and those called overseers. And then we also have references to deacons in other letters as well. So most likely the, the uh, things do not solidify the way they did in church tradition later. In the second century, we start to hear about bishops and priests and deacons. And then post-reformation, we have a different model with Baptists and others. 
but probably it was a bit less clear in the early days. And it's hard to know, despite every denomination wanting to say, we have the New Testament model, it's hard to know exactly how they did it, other than to say they obviously were leaders and it seems they were often plural leaders, which is why even in Episcopal type models, you'll have some kind of church council for each parish. So even if you have a one overall pastor, in reality, you might end up like a Baptist church. You've got some kind of senior pastor and you've got some kind of group of elders who provide oversight. So uh, things are not always that different from denomination to denomination in that uh, respect. Uh, that Philip, was a little bit of I, history. I don't know if, Randy, you, you go ahead. You have something you were going to say. Yeah, I, I just turned to Romans 16 mm -hmm. uh, because there's a long list of people that Paul commends to the Roman church. And those right. people generally, it's, they're described as uh, greet them and the church in their house. So right. these were apparently uh, not only heads of households, but heads of churches, yes. uh, church planters or whatever. He doesn't use the word overseer or bishop there. No. Uh, he uses frequently the word servant, which right. is interesting how he describes himself mm -hmm. in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a yeah. servant of Christ yeah. Jesus. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't know necessarily that that means that uh, these... Uh, uh, offices were not yet established. I think the vocabulary certainly right. wasn't established, but the office of those who were leading the church, uh, yeah. that appears to have been established. Uh, they just weren't sure what to call them quite yet. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we have a later, if we read through some of the early church writings post, the, after the New Testament canon, or uh, some of them are actually some of them are written around a similar time to some of the later writings like Revelation, but they're not in the canon. But most of them are later. Um, the Apostolic begin to, Fathers? The Church Fathers, the Apostolic Fathers, so right. Clement and, and other people. We begin to see the emergence of the, uh, they talk about the threefold order, so bishop being above a priest, being above a deacon. And that's still the way a lot of the historic older denominations do things. Um, as Randy was saying, deacon really just comes from a Greek word, diakonos, and we have a verb that's the same family that just means servant, serving. So not slave, not the same word as slave, uh, but a word that just means to serve. So these things seem to become uh, solidified in terms of hierarchy and office and structure uh, later, but it seems like it was more fluid. Um, these terms maybe weren't used as precisely, but we did have leaders, we did have a plurality of leaders, we did have oversight. These things were very important, but maybe there wasn't necessarily one uh, static model. There was a kind of evol evolving model over time. Anyway, let's move on. Um, we saw also that sufferings, as I said, as paired again with glory. We get a word for suffering here used in the uh, first one and verse nine of this section. And uh, in the previous chapter, of course, later on, he had said, rejoice insofar as you share in the sufferings of Christ. The verb to suffer appears 11 times in Peter, three times in chapter four, as well as in this letter. So that's a, a very key theme. So if we go on to, okay, we've talked about who are the elders. So let's look at verses two to four. And um, we then move on to the sort of content of the exhortation. So he says, I'm going to exhort you, I charge you. Now he's going to tell us, okay, what is this I'm asking you to do? So if you think about um, verses uh, two and four, um, what, what is, uh, I've written two to three here, but it's three, two to four. So how should the elders act towards others in the church, others in the congregation, and why should they act that way? What, what did you see, Randy, as you looked at that? Well, first of all is the use of the word shepherd, which yeah. uh, certainly, um, it's certainly descriptive in an agrarian uh, uh, culture like Israel would have been. Everybody right. would easily know what a shepherd is, uh, not necessarily a, uh, that, that's not a position that a young boy aspires to in order to make it in the world. No. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's kind of a, a, of a, not demeaning, but it's, they're, they're farmers, they're livestock farmers. Right. And, but their care for the sheep is uh, famous. Mm. Uh, they, uh, <laughs> what I've been told is that sheep are stupid. 
<laughs> and the shepherd has to be smart for them. Right. So he has to feed them. He has to guide them. He has to uh, take care of them, find them when they've strayed and they're lost and can't find the flock. And he calls them shepherds. Yeah. <clears throat> he says uh, they're to uh, serve, serve as overseers. Yeah. Uh, not greedy, eager to serve, not lording it over, being examples. So he, he appears to do this, not this way, but yes. this way, not this way, but right. this way. And, <laughs> yeah, uh, very, it's very descriptive. Yes. And when he finishes, he says, and remember that you too have a shepherd. You have a chief shepherd. Right. And uh, he'll be caring for you. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Yeah, that's very helpful. Very helpful summary there. Yeah. So as Randy said, there's a lot of shepherd language. Um, he uh, he literally says, well, we don't need to, we will come back to this in a bit. Um, but what, uh, let me just ask Randy, so to, just for the sake of the video, what, what kind of uh, shepherd images can we think of in the Bible then? Oh my. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> Psalm 23. Uh, I, yeah. I read through that again this morning. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. So God shepherds Israel. Then you have uh, shepherds uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, shepherds that they see literally, physically. Right. Um, the king of Israel hmm. is called a shepherd. I, I think of Micah who's asked to give a prophecy for King Jehoshaphat, I think it is, of Judah, who's there with Ahab, of, uh, or Ahaz, I think, of, yes. of Israel. Yeah. And uh, Jehoshaphat says, I see Israel as sheep without a shepherd. So uh, the, there's uh, the king, the, the yeah. shepherd is, is kind of dignified, I think, yes. in scripture. Yes. Hmm. Uh, Jesus's parables. The, yeah. Shepherd who had a hundred sheep lost one and mm -hmm. left the 99 in the wilderness until he could find the one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at some of those things. Randy's laid that out very helpfully for us there. As you say, um, the Lord is my shepherd, perhaps the best known Psalm in the Psalter, Psalm 23. We get that image in other places as well. Psalm 78 is one of those Psalms where we have a lengthy section of narrative where it talks about uh, what God did for his people. And it says he guided his people out of Egypt. They'll often tell the story of the Exodus in these kinds of Psalms and through the wilderness. And then it specifically says, like a shepherd. Um, we get a lengthy passage, very, very lengthy passage in Ezekiel 34, which may be something of a background to much of Jesus' ministry. That's another interesting uh, thing I think I talked about in the, 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 um, series of videos we did on the ministry and teaching of Jesus. But we get um, a parable here, you might say, or at least figurative language used for talking about the way that the leaders of Israel had failed to care for God's people. He, uh, the Lord describes them as unfaithful shepherds and he rebukes them. And he says that I myself, this is the Lord God speaking in Ezekiel 34 through the prophet, I myself will search after the flock and will be their shepherd. And in, and in the midst of that passage, Verse 23, we get the promise of one shepherd, it says. There'll be one shepherd who'll bring the, the, the people together, who he calls my servant David. Now, we know about King David, but King David had actually died long before that. So it's not talking about a, a literal resurrected David, but just as we get this image that we see in the Old Testament, and we very much get it in the Gospels, of there's going to be what we might call a Davidic, as using that as an adjective, David-like messiah fulfilling the prophet the um the promises to him and his for his son uh, solomon and, and their descendants there's going to be a future uh, shepherd my servant david which we would see fulfilled in jesus a messianic shepherd king figure uh, and as um uh, randy said we get shepherds uh, we get kings i'm sorry referred to as shepherds as well uh jesus compares himself to sh uh, the shepherd to god in parables we have the the um the sheep that go astray, which appear in two slightly different versions in Luke and um, Matthew. Um, we have uh, 
the good, I am the good shepherd, Jesus says of himself, of course, famously in John 10. And then we also get, if you think about the parable of the sheep and the goats, this is almost like a, she a shepherd king at the end of the age who divides the sheep from the goats. Kind of interesting imagery there. But as you say, the shepherds uh, on the one hand were seen as uh, sometimes a little dirty, a little rough, a little you know, working class or something we might say, or not, not the kind of the, um, in the same category as the good and the great. Um, that's one of the interesting things about the, the birth of Jesus, the story of uh, the infancy narratives where the shepherds, um, you know, have this revelation from the angels. Um, but, but also an imagery of someone who cares for the sheep, who's caring for them. And as Randy says, really, because the sheep are so stupid, they're so apt to just run away. If we think about, uh, again, all we like sheep have gone astray. Famous, another famous verse we encounter often at Christmas through Handel's Messiah. Um, we have a tendency, the sheep have a tendency to get lost, like the parable, to get muddled. And so there's the sense the shepherd really has a big responsibility to take everything upon themselves to make sure the sheep are, are okay. Um, we also get, uh, so the shepherd is used here like a verb, so shepherd uh, in verse two, shepherd the flock of God, that's a verb. <clears throat> we also get um, in Ephesians 4, the word that we think of for pastor, when we talk about a pastor in English. We have lots of pastors at New Hope. When we read in, in Ephesians 4 that there are pastors and teachers and these different roles within the church, the, the word for what we're translating, the, all the English translations I think are translating pastor, is actually the word for shepherd. Uh, so that's really the word for pastor in the New Testament, congregational leaders. They're shepherds of the flock, literally. Um, and then think of the word flock, shepherd the flock of God, Peter says, that is under you. Um, Israel is described as a flock quite a few times, uh, famously in Psalm 95, Psalm, Psalm 100, uh, the, shop, the, the people of his care, the flock, you know, the sheep of his pasture, and then the prophets. Um, the disciples are described as being like sheep, which uh, is quite appropriate in one or two places. Um, so Jeremiah talks about the Lord's flock, or Zechariah says the Lord God Almighty will watch over his flock. And actually in Luke 12, just, just in this one passage, one verse, Jesus refers to the little flock, again, talking about his disciples. Um, in Paul's speech to the Ephesian elders, the ones that I talked to you about uh, in the previous slide or two, he calls, he talks about the flock, um, meaning talking about really the universal church, actually, at this point, the flock for which Christ shed his blood. And also actually the verb for shepherding is used there. And then thinking about Peter, if you remember, Peter is restored after denying Jesus. Just We have this story just in John 21. Remember, after the resurrection story in chapter 20, we have this kind of extra chapter. And Peter, uh, Jesus says to Peter, you know, Peter denied Jesus three times. Um, Jesus says to him three times, feed my lambs or feed my sheep. Uh, ten, feed my lambs, tend my sheep. So it's interesting we have it in this letter here from Peter. And then, as, as Randy said, we have these contrasts, not out of compulsion, but willingly or intentionally, not greedily, but eagerly. Then in verse, uh, we also have how not to rule, verse three, don't lord it, he says, not lording it uh, over the, uh, the flock or over those in your charge, the lot. And interestingly, this verb to lord it over is not used very often at all in um, the, uh, the New Testament, I should have taken those parallel lines off, but that, off, but that just means parallels. Um, but uh, Jesus talks in a couple of places or in a couple of gospels have this reference to Jesus uh, saying, uh, Jesus calls his, his disciples together and says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And that's the same kind of thing. That's what the Gentiles do. So it's interesting because Peter has been saying it saying again and again to an audience that we said is predominantly Gentile, maybe exclusively Gentile, you're not like the Gentiles, even though technically, ethnically, they are Gentiles. But he's saying in sort of contradistinction to how they used to be, you are, uh, he, and then he uses these Jewish terms to say, you know, you're part of the people of God, like the people of Israel. So it's interesting he uses this term, not lording it over, like he said, the Gentiles, like Jesus said the Gentiles to do. And then he uses this term saying, but being an example being examples to them. And the word he uses here is the word from which we get our English word type. 
being a type to them. This is uh, just the, the um, uh, way that Paul and Timothy and Titus in different places in Paul's letters are, it's either said that they are or, or should be a type to the audience. So we've got this real sense, haven't we, here of this very countercultural picture of humility, of servanthood, just like we have Jesus in John 13 washing the feet of his disciples. It's this same kind of thing, not, not being a dictator, not uh, fulfilling the sort of expectations of the culture, the big boss, the big man, but serving, being humble. And then, as Randy said, he is described as literally the chief shepherd. Then we get a reference to a crown. But when uh, the chief shepherd appears, you'll be given, uh, you'll receive, an, um, I don't know if you have uh, this phrase a little bit like this, an unfading crown or an imperishable crown, maybe. A crown of glory that will never fade away. That will never fade away. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're, the, so this crown is not about ruling, although we've been hearing about ruling in the previous verse. But uh, some sort of, uh, but it's really it translates also the word, uh, or could translate as the word wreath, like a, like a, a something we might put on the head of, of victors when they win a race. So it, uh, or a garland, you know. Um, so at the end of uh, races, athletics, and there were a lot of races being held in the ancient world, the Olympics, of course, and other races in Corinth, near Corinth and other places. And it was a very familiar sight that when someone has won the race, you know, they they burst through the tape. Uh, they're crowned with this kind of wreath, a garland. And in fact, Paul uses this imagery in 1 Corinthians 9, exactly the same kind of imagery. So you're going to receive this reward, we might say, for victory in the race when the, when the Lord Jesus appears. So thinking about his second coming, his return. Uh, Paul said, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-discipline, uh, self-control, they do it to receive a perishable wreath, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, same word, but we an imperishable. And it kind of reminds us um, that uh, just like you remember in very early on in chapter one, we read about a, a, an inheritance being stored up for us in heaven that is imperishable. Again, it comes from um, the same uh, family of words. It's a verb, I think, but it's the same family, it's the same root. So we've got this contrast again, not like this, but like that, not fading away, not withering, not like flowers that wither, like thinking of, Paul, of Peter's um, uh, illustration, quoting from the Psalms, you know, that the flowers fade and um, uh, that's from Isaiah, actually, the flowers fade and, and the grass, you know, fades away, but it's going to be imperishable. Then he switches uh, to talk about in verse five uh, to a different group the younger ones, and again follows with a series of commands, and he moves now to a different theme. So if we look at verse five, how should those ones conduct themselves and why? So thinking about, we've asked that question about the elders, now how does he say, Randy, that these, this other group, what he calls the younger ones, how should they conduct themselves and why? Well, uh, he says two things, they should be submissive and they should be <coughs> humble. Right. Yeah. Are those related terms, do you think? Well, he has, yeah, related. I mean, they're not um, kind of related in terms of the language, but yeah, to submit. And we've had actually this phrase of submitting the wives to the husband, uh, the wives of the husbands. Yes, I said that right. In chapter three. Um, and we have that in Paul's writings as well, talking about the proper respect due to the, those in authority over you in the church. But yeah, strong emphasis on humility here. Um, uh, clothe yourselves, he says, with humility. But then he says towards one another. So it's not just towards the elders, but it's to each other. Since then, he says, God uh, opposes, he stands opposed to the, to the uh, proud, the proud ones, but he gives grace to the humble ones, the humble. So who are the younger ones? Well, we don't, exactly no but um it seems most likely he's really talking about all the others who are not the elders just to put it very simply so it seems like he's addressing the wider congregation there's not maybe a sense like there is perhaps in first john that there may be multiple groups when he uses this kind of language it seems more just like he's talking about the, the non-elders and he's citing um uh, he picks up this theme of humility which we had 
uh, in the previous chapter and the way we're supposed to do things to one another. We had this kind of reciprocal language to one another. And then remember, we talked earlier <clears throat> in two places. Um, it talks about uh, girding up the loins of your mind, that wonderful phrase I've used on several occasions which we said was a little bit like Jesus taking the towel, you know, putting it around himself when he was uh, disrobed and just putting on the towel and then serving the disciples, washing their feet. We had that phrase last week about arming yourself with something. And again, it's the same thing, clothing yourselves, clothing yourself with humility. We get a quote here from Proverbs 3 verse 34. It's an exact quote. We don't have time to talk about this, but there's a lot of parallels between 1 Peter and James, especially in the later chapters, um, particularly in this chapter, actually, a lot of connections with uh, the later chapters of James, but we get this exact same um, scripture used, uh, quoted in James. It's interesting to think how that, what the relationship is there. And I put a couple of references on the screen from Matthew. And again, it's interesting to think about how Peter often seems to use uh, language and illustrations that we find in the Gospels, particularly the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So Peter said, uh, uh, Jesus, I'm sorry, said in Matthew 20, um, talking about this phrase that I just mentioned, and that not like the Gentiles uh, ruling it over other people. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. And then in Matthew 23, just one example of a number of places where we have this saying, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. So not lording it over those but um clothed with humility because god opposes the proud but gives grace and again notice this emphasis on grace being empowered with grace that we get again and again in this letter god gives grace to the humble any other thoughts on these verses randy before we move on to the next section okay well, not really very full yeah well could you read to us please verses 6 to 14 so that's just the rest of the chapter <clears throat> certainly <clears throat> Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little, little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I've written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings. So does my son Mark. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Thank you, Randy. Okay, let's take a look at the first couple of verses, verses 6 and 7. So, um, we have another... Um, therefore, so then, or so therefore, we have that little particle again, just as we got at the beginning of verse one. So it seems to suggest to us that this is another a new section, but building on the previous section. So how does it say we should relate to God and why, if we look at verses six and seven? Well, the command that's given here is to cast your anxiety on him. Um, yeah. Yeah. Humble yourself. Mm -hmm. Cast your anxiety on him. Yeah. And why should we do that? When we humble ourselves, he lifts, lifts us up. When we cast our anxiety on him, he takes that anxiety and makes it his own. He cares for us. Yeah. So he gives a very specific reason, a very specific grounding for both those instructions, doesn't he? Uh, because hum so just like we we've had a number of places in the gospels we just mentioned those who, hum who um, uh, humble themselves will be exalted that's very much what peter says in verse five isn't it and then again casting your anxieties your cares on him because he cares for you 
So we continue with this theme of humility. This is what you might call a passive command in terms of the grammar. We don't often think about this this way. So one way of uh, so trying to think about how should we translate a, a command, which is almost something that is done to us, if you like, how does that work? Um, one commentator said, uh, accept your humble status, so to speak. There's kind of a, set, a passive sense to something that's been given, as well as the fact we have to, we've been commanded to do something, try to capture this sense. Uh, previously, it was talking about humble, um, being uh, humility towards one another. Here, this time is very much towards uh, God, just as we get that uh, emphasis in the Gospels. And then we have um, this reference to being uh, exalted, being lifted up under the mighty hand. Do you have a phrase like that? Under the mighty hand of God or God's mighty hand or something like that? Yeah, that he may lift you up under God's mighty hand. Yeah. So here we get a very specific uh, reference uh, to a, a body part, you might say, to anthropomorphic language. Uh, we get a lot of references to the hand of the Lord in the Old Testament, talking about kind of his strength, his power, uh, but also to God's mighty hand. Something like that phrase appears quite a lot. These are just some of the references. There are many, many more, uh, particularly in those first five books in the Bible. So in Exodus, in Deuteronomy especially, and often used in connection with uh, God's deliverance of Israel from slavery in Egypt that he with a mighty hand, he delivered them, he, he picked them up. Um, and then he says, in due time, this could be just talking about um, some, uh, this translation has at the proper time, which kind of, it makes it quite specific. It's literally just in time. So this is the translation trying to kind of interpret it. Some have thought it might be a reference to the last days at, at the sort of the last time. We're not completely sure, could, could, could go either way really. Or maybe there's a bit of both. And then there's a reference to um, uh, th this reference to casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Um, there's quite a number of words there that are, have a lot in common with the words used in the Greek version of Psalm 55 verse 22, which is a little different, but it's some similarities. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. Um, could be even being that casting our cares on him is the means by which we accept our humble status. In other words, rather than trying to be independent, rather than trying to say, I've got it under control, I can work it out. Uh, rather than trying to fix things ourselves, we're casting our cares on him and saying, no, I can't do it, you, you have to do it. And then if we think about um, uh, casting our anxieties because he cares for you, again, um, that really puts us in mind of some famous sayings in the gospels, doesn't it? We find it in Matthew 6 and also in Luke 12, um, very similar phrases about do not be anxious about your life you know your father knows what you need uh, look at the birds of the air your heavenly father feeds them um, why are you anxious you know you little, little faith uh, again it could be very much looking back to the kind of the teaching of Jesus here and of course we get Paul also uh, talking about our anxieties and, and casting our cares on on him in, in uh, uh, not being anxious in Philippians 4. Okay Looking on to verses eight and nine. So what does Peter want his readers to know? He says in verses eight and nine, and then what does he warn them to do? So looking at verses yeah, eight and nine. Boy, there's a bunch of uh, <laughs> yeah. little commands here. Yeah. Uh, he wants them to know that the enemy is prowling for them. Mm -hmm. He wants them to know that their brothers throughout the world yeah. are undergoing suffering. Yeah. That's right. So they've got to be aware, um, specifically of the devil. We're going to come to that in a minute. Uh, we've got to stand firm, got to be aware of what uh, others are going through. Um, and then uh, three or four uh, quick little commands yeah. as far as what he wants them to do. Yeah. He wants them to be self-controlled. Right. He wants them to be alert. Yep. He wants them to resist the devil. Mm -hmm. And he wants them to stand firm in the faith. Yes, absolutely. It talks about the devil uh, trying to devour Christians. We're going to come back to this. But um, what tactics might the devil use, do we think, 
to devour Christians. Uh, we might even get an idea from this, uh, these passages about, um, uh, you know, what, what Paul is, uh, Peter, I'm sorry, is telling us to do might reflect a little bit on the tactics the devil might use it. So how should we, uh, what, what might he try to do to devour Christians? How are they going to resist the devil? Well, how long do we have? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know the answer to that. <laughs> he, he uses any and all methods uh, right. and anything that he can do. Yeah. And that, that's kind of the idea of a, of a lion. He'll be yeah. sneaky. He'll, mm -hmm. he'll attack quickly and, yes. and ferociously and devastatingly. Yeah. Um, as far as ways that he does uh, temptations and uh, external attacks. Yeah. Um, although in Jesus' ministry, you see a lot of demoniacs, hmm. uh, there's not a lot of reference to that. I can't remember a single reference to that in any of the epistles. Hmm. So uh, Satan's attacks... I don't think are primarily possession type attacks. It's much more subtle than that. It's he's sneaky. He's a lion. <laughs> he's a he's a yeah. cat that hides until it sees its opportunity and then it pounces. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So Peter gives very strict uh, warnings. He says, literally, be sober minded. He's actually used this verb a couple of times earlier, and be watchful. That's actually the verb that uh, uh, Peter, again, thinking of Peter and thinking of the Gospels uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus says, watch and pray, that you don't fall into temptation. Um, and that's, know, got... that's really interesting because yeah. that's what Jesus told him to do, and he didn't. No, exactly. He just stopped. <laughs> they fell asleep. <laughs> they weren't very sober-minded, weren't very awake. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so we're told that the uh, the devil is your ad. Uh, do you have adversary or your enemy or what does it say at the early on in verse eight? Your, your enemy. Your, your enemy. enemy. Yeah, your enemy. Okay. So your adversary. Um, this was often this word used here was uh, often used in in court settings. One who brings a case in a lawsuit, an accuser, a plaintiff, someone who uh, brings a case against the defendant. Um, so this brings us to this term, the devil, <laughs> the devil. So the devil, um, we're going to, I'm going to talk about this in a moment. The devil and Satan, two terms we get that crop up a lot in the New Testament. They're both words that predate the New Testament. They were, they're not just Christian words, if you like. Uh, the devil literally means something like slanderer, uh, someone who slanders, who brings accusations, um, we get slandering used. Uh, now, the interesting thing is we have plural opposition in Peter. Um, different people accusing, uh, who, who are opposing the church, humans opposing the church, but here it's a singular individual. So where does this word come from? Well, uh, the, in the Greek Old Testament, this word from which we get uh, diabolic, <laughs> you know that phrase, uh, adjective, di the diabolos is literally the word translated into English as the devil. Um, that uh, is used consistently to translate Satan. Now, in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, uh, written in Hebrew, we have the Satan, the Satan, does actually appear in the Old Testament, and it's consistently translated the devil, the diabolos, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which would have been the kind of the Bible of Jesus and Paul and Peter and others. Um, that word crops up just a very small number of times in the Old Testament. Uh, it appears as a sort of accuser in First Chronicles. It says that the, the, this person, the devil or the Satan, the accuser, stood up to incite David to number Israel. Or in Zechariah, we get this sort of picture almost of a, um, a figure, almost like a heavenly prosecutor in the council of uh, heavenly council. And the devil stood at his right hand, the right hand of Joshua, the high priest, to oppose him. Um, we get also um, Job. In the first couple of chapters of Job, you remember you get this, the devil um, speaking to God about Job. Um, he appears um, uh, 13 times in ten, just 10 verses in Job 1 to 2. 
again as a kind he's very of very much an accuser there is very it? much an accuser again yeah very much bringing accusations bringing charges you might say in the council in the court almost against job god's servant um but otherwise this figure this ter this term is used rarely in the old testament and it's not really defined are we talking about the same person each time who are we talking about then we get uh, it later we have all this jewish literature that's not in the old testament that's not in the new testament but would have been known in jesus day some of it contemporary with the new testament some in the centuries after the old testament but before the first century and Satan in that literature becomes a much more prominent figure, someone who tempts the human race to sin, someone who accuses people before God, who tries to interfere in the history of Israel. Then in the New Testament, we get um, this term, the devil, this term Satan. As I said, in the Greek Old Testament, they're using devil to translate Satan. So they clearly see them as kind of the same thing. Um, and we get them almost an equal number of times. I think it's 36 times to 35 times in the New Testament. So very much equivalent terms. Um, and uh, seems to, uh, clearly talking about the same being. But we don't get uh, a lot of elaboration on that. Well, we have evil one is another term used in John 17. And if the Lord's prayer should be taken to mean deliver us from the evil one, it could be deliver us from evil. That will be another example. John has this very specific term um, where John doesn't talk about in the gospel about the devil and Satan in the way that we do in the other gospels with the temptations in the wilderness, etc. But he calls him either the ruler or some translations have the prince of this world. Same phrase used three times. Um, Second Corinthians has a similar phrase, the God of this age, similar kind of idea. And then we get other terms used, the serpent we get in Revelation. Um, and actually that's tied to the devil, um, the, the, the word devil. Beliar, <laughs> an odd one, which appears in 2 Corinthians, that would take a bit of explaining. The tempter. So this, this being who we don't get told as much as we'd maybe like to know, but one who is absolutely opposed to God. As Randy said, we get um, emphasis on demons or unclean spirits being expelled. Um, but in John, um, almost sets the template for what we get in the Paul's letters in that there's almost like an expulsion, an exorcism of the God of this uh, age, the ruler of this world, being cast out, almost like the demons are cast out. Um, so the focus is very much not so much on demons in the letters and other places outside of the Gospels and Acts, but much more on this singular being behind, it, behind evil, who's opposed to God. But we should say... Um, just to clarify theologically, because God is the creator and everyone else is creatures, this is not a figure of equal and opposite strength or significance. We always should remember that. God is the creator, everyone else is a creature. He's described as deceiving, tempting, lying, condemning, sinning, and all sorts of other things. Okay, uh, Roaring Lion. He's prowling around Roaring Lion. We have a precedent for this in the Old Testament. We have uh, Israel is a hunted sheep driven away by lions. And we're told the king of Assyria devours him, devoured Israel. We have Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has devoured me, it says, um, in uh, chapter 51 of uh, Jeremiah, they, they shall roar together like lions. And uh, a, fr a phrase that some think is perhaps a little bit in Peter's mind here from Psalm 22, famous psalm used in relation to Jesus in his crucifixion. You know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And other, other verses used in the, in the crucifixion. It says, they opened their mouth against me. So they opposed God's righteous one or God's servant like a ravenous and roaring lion. Very much the same kind of idea. The, the, the roaring lion who seeks to devour. And in other places in Amos, Ezekiel, we're told that the lion is roaring in search of prey and also one who provides, who, who brings out great fear. Okay, anything else to say about that, Randy, before we move on? It's a bit okay, frightening, let's move on to our it? next section. Very frightening stuff, but it's so we are told uh, very strong terms. Be sober minded. You've really got to be on the alert. Be watchful. Um, I think it was C.S. Lewis who said in the two equal and opposite errors that the church tends to fall into. One is um, putting too much attention on the devil, which certain traditions do, but many of ours do not, it has to be said. And then in many of our own traditions, kind of, uh, just neglecting him, not, not imagining he's there. Uh, so we shouldn't put too much emphasis on the devil. 
imagining the devil is behind every rock sort of thing. Um, but equally, we can just say, well, that's kind of something for the, the old, you know, <laughs> a mythical belief for superstitious times, but, but uh, we can forget that he's there. Resist him standing firm in your faith. So looking at verses nine, I think actually Randy already uh, said this in relation to our previous questions. We should remember, you, you, you said to us, don't you, that other, didn't you, that other people are going through this. It's not just us. And we can feel very alone, can't we, in our churches and the pandemic. We've been more isolated than ever before, often in our homes. Um, we can imagine we're alone. We're the only Christian at work, maybe. We're the only Christian in our neighborhood, the only Christian in our family. We're perhaps say, experiencing some kind of opposition for our faith. But remember, it says that your uh, same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. That's why it's sometimes good to remember, the, uh, not sometimes good, it's good to remember always the persecuted church. Uh, many of our brothers and sisters are, we face degrees of opposition in Western society, but throughout the world, there are people facing much more severe uh, uh, opposition. We can read about this through organizations like Voices of the Martyrs, um, it's one called the Barnabas Fund, Christian Solidarity International, Open Doors. Uh, we can hear about and pray for and remember those suffering. It's also a reminder, so we have a resist, and actually in James we have resist the devil and he will flee from you. Ephesians, the armour of God, stand firm, again talking about the devil. It's a reminder to us that although uh, he talks about the, uh, throughout the letter of people who are opposing us, the Gentiles are opposing us, he says, unbelievers are opposing us, what he calls the disobedient. But our real enemy, like Ephesians 6 says, you know, our, our, our real battle, um, or 2 Corinthians, is not flesh and blood. But it's, it's the ruler of the world. In this case, it's the devil. And there's a reminder um, that grace is there for us. Uh, grace is given in suffering, verse 10. After you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, a great phrase used here, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. We have four verbs. They may have slightly different translation. Um, but this sense that when he says a little, I think there's a contrast here really between it may be significant faith, uh, significant suffering or significant persecution, but little by comparison to eternal which he had in the previous, uh, which he has in this verse, his eternal glory. Just like Paul talks in uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 4 about, um, you know, our light and momentary suffering. You might think, well, it's not light and momentary, it's difficult. But compared to the, you know, the great uh, things that await us that will go on for eternity. Um, and suffering and glory are contrasted. Just as in, remember, in, remember in chapter one, verses six to seven, he said, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation, at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So very much the same theme at the beginning and at the end of the letter. All right, and then he begin, He has another doxology, another word of glory. To him be the dominion and glory forever and ever. Amen. So just briefly, we have some closing words here. But we actually learn a little bit, maybe at least implicit, about why he wrote the letter. Uh, so, Brandy, why does it seem he might have written the letter? What clues might he have given us here? Well, he, he states in verse 12, uh, I've written you to encourage you and to testify that this is the true grace of God. I wonder if he's, is he saying there, this is the theology you should stand in? Uh, he, he does say stand fast in it. And uh, yeah. that, that would seem, although um, grace, I don't think is used very much in the New Testament to describe theology. It, it, mm -hmm. It's God's character, not Right. Not the theological position. Yeah. What, I mean, one <laughs> obvious question is, what is, the, what is the this? And of course, different people have different uh, ideas. Testify this to be the true grace of God. Is he talking about just the things he said in the last verse or two? Uh, mm -hmm. Not verse 11, but the verses before that. Is he talking about the whole letter? Um, 
we're not sure. But certainly he's talking about, he's talked a lot about grace, about the God of glory, the God has called you. So yeah, he said, I'm exhorting or test, or what did you have there? I have exhorting and declaring. You had a different phrase. Encouraging and testifying. Right, yes. Encouraging. So we have this verb, which can mean, yeah, to encourage, to console. It can also mean to kind of, to call, to exhort. And uh, testifying, definitely, yeah, or declaring is what this translation has. So he's written to the flat purpose, encouragement, uh, strengthening, establishing. And we also see a little bit, um, I'll just go briefly through this. We've got these relationships between uh, the churches here, haven't we? Uh, remember, he's writing to a scattered group. We have greetings between different people who are se physically separated but are connected. We have the term of um, uh, greet one another with a kiss of love. <laughs> That's how they did it in those days. So deep affection between them. Just briefly, we have some names mentioned. And I, now I noticed that your translation said Silas. Yeah. Verse uh, 13. With the help of Silas, and then a note Probably. says in Greek, it's Sylvanus. Okay, yes, that, will, that answered my question, yeah. So we have this unusual name, Sylvanus. Now, Sylvanus is actually mentioned as the co-author of First and Second Thessalonians, Paul and Sylvanus. He's also mentioned in Second Corinthians. Most people think he's probably the same person as Silas. We sometimes had, in the ancient world, you could have, um, you could have three names, or you could have a sort of a Latinized version, a, a Greek version. So Paul, uh, remember in Acts, it says not so much that Saul changed his name to Paul, which is what we tend to hear in children's Sunday school, but that Saul, who was also called Paul, Saul seemed to be more like his Hebrew name, his Jewish name, uh, Paul was a, a, a Latin name, and it seems to be that when Luke shifts with the mission to the Roman parts of the empire, I mean the Roman Empire, we hear that name. So it could be that uh, Silvanus is more like the kind of Latinized name, Silas is more like a Hebrew type name. So probably the same person as Silas. Silas appears regularly in Acts, particularly Acts 15 to 18. We're told that he and another man are leading men among the brothers of Jerusalem church, uh, the Jerusalem church. He and uh, Judas Barsabbas are called prophets in Acts 15. He seems to, he's becomes one of the associates um, of Paul on his missionary journeys and uh, also a co-founder of the church. It might appear if we look at the Second Corinthians, but that's another story. He then says he's written to them. Um, I don't know what yours says. I don't know if it says, actually, my translation says by Sylvanus at the very, very beginning. Does it say it says, with the help of Sylvanus? Yeah, so there's a bit of interpretation there. We've got literally one preposition which could mean by or through. Most take it as through. Paul did have certainly had co writers that are mentioned, co authors. But probably because he didn't mention his name in verse 1 of chapter 1, it could mean uh, he, that the letter was going to be delivered through Sylvanus or Silas rather than him writing it. And we had very, uh, very significant figures in the early church who, uh, if you think that the majority of Christians could not read, the majority of people could not read, it's estimated that maybe only 10 to 15% of Christians were literate in the early church. So most couldn't read. There weren't multiple copies. So someone would deliver the letter for Paul who needed to be highly literate, uh, not just someone who could read, but someone who could read and almost expound the letter, bring it to life. We might say perform it almost uh, in front of the congregation. So that could be that Sylvanus was entrusted with this crucial role of bringing the letter to them, not just being the mailman, but actually bringing it to life. Then we have this strange phrase here. Uh, verse 13 um it says in my very you have very different translations mine says she who is at babylon who is likewise chosen yours was quite quite a bit different to that although it's really the same different wording but same idea um what did you have in is it the niv i think in verse 13 she who is in babylon chosen together with you yeah so who is what is he talking about we have literally a fellow elect person feminine together with in babylon feminine is this a woman <laughs> but no woman has been mentioned it would be seem strange just to throw that in there at the last minute so most people think that they, he doesn't mean peter's wife who we hear about in first uh, corinthians 9 and in the gospels uh, but maybe a personification even of the church the congregation 
Now, what does he mean, she who is in Babylon? <laughs> who's she who's in Babylon? Why Babylon? That's a great question. That's a great I question. Have no idea. <laughs> but what's the great answer? Yeah, it's a tricky one. <laughs> well, uh, Babylon, the city of Babylon was actually in ruins at this period. So it's highly unlikely that um, it was literally in Babylon. If you know that uh, Babylon certainly becomes a figurative place for um, a figurative town name, city name for a place of sinfulness. It's used repeatedly in the book of Revelation, where Revelation doesn't seem to be talking about the literal city of Babylon, but it becomes a sort of a, a cipher for something, uh, for an evil place. And actually, we don't have time for this, but sometimes in Revelation, it seems that the vision is targeting Rome as the personification, the Roman Empire with the worship of the, of the, of the emperor, the imperial cult, as the kind of personification of idolatry. And, that, and there are references in Revelation that seem to allude to physical aspects of the topography, the, the sort of geography, the hills and so on, of Rome um, as Babylon. So probably he's talking about Rome. Um, and we also know that uh, the Christian tradition is that Peter was in Rome. Um, uh, Papius, Papius says that uh, Mark um, composed, um, was composed in Rome and uh, that he uses, uh, he, he talks about him referring to the city metaphorically as Babylon. And of course, Mark is also, Papius tells us, he thinks that uh, Peter lies behind Mark's gospel. So probably he's talking about Rome. Then we get a brief reference to Mark, just very briefly. We have a John Mark in Acts. We have a John also in Acts, who probably is also John Mark. And confusingly, we have a Mark in Acts. <laughs> All these people are probably the same person. John Mark, sometimes known as John, sometimes known as Mark, who also appears in some of these prison epistles in Philemon and Colossians, and also in 2 Timothy. So that's probably who we're talking about. Any thoughts or questions um, as we close out this, these verses before we just briefly reflect on uh, some questions as we end? Randy, anything else? No, this, this would be the same Mark that's the author of the gospel, correct? Could be. <laughs> could be. Yeah. Could be. Yeah, we're not sure. Um, could be. Yeah. Uh, John Mark, it seems, probably. But uh, yeah, we, we could be. So, some questions just to ask ourselves in reflection, then I'd like to ask Randy a couple of questions that we can just very briefly uh, share about. How can we best shepherd those under our care? We might be leaders in Sunday school, adult Sunday school, children's Sunday school, youth leaders. Um, we might be on the church council. We may have other responsibilities. So even if we're not one of the paid pastors of the church, like Randy or Jason or somebody on the stage, we may still have leadership position, how can we shepherd those under our care? How can we clothe ourselves with humility? What practical ways could we do that in our relationships with one another? How do we need to resist the devil in our context? What kind of things do we face? Are we prepared to suffer for our faith? Do we have that right perspective towards spiritual opposition? And then I'd just like to ask Randy briefly as we finish, one thing I talked about as we, uh, I think I talked about when we looked at Philippians, one principle that we can apply to ourselves when we're reading any book of the Bible is to ask ourselves, okay, we have a lot of books of the Bible. We have a lot of overlap between things. But if we uh, took this book out of the Bible, if we ripped the pages out of our Bible, which is hard to imagine, and this wasn't there, what would we lose? What contribution could we say? Does this particular book, whether it's a very short book like Third, uh, third Letter of John or whether it's very long book like uh, Ezekiel or Genesis. What would we lose if that book wasn't there? What special contribution does it make? And also what kind of, maybe uh, Randy, I'm sure have read through this letter many, many times in your life. Was there something particular that stood out for you this time around or, or things that stood out for you this time around? So just a couple of brief thoughts on that. Yeah, just some, just some brief thoughts. Um, we would miss First uh, Peter chapter two, uh, that that passage. You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, so that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. 
Yeah. That's, that's kind of a poetic form of the Great Commission, I think. It's a, it's a charge to all Christians to declare his praises in the darkness that we live in, but doing it from a position not of fear of what we might say, but of knowing that we're chosen, we're a priesthood, we're a holy, we belong to God. Uh, we would miss that. Yeah. Um, there's, I, I don't think there's any novelty. There's, I, I can't think of any ideas that are here that are nowhere else, but Peter's way of stating it is just so beautiful. Yeah. And frequently he, he looks back at, uh, even Christ's words. Um, yeah, a lot of echoes. Of, yeah, 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 so many echoes of Jesus, yeah. and it just makes sense <laughs> yeah. that uh, the Peter of the Gospels would be deeply impacted by what Christ had said. Right, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was uh, um, struck having looked at it maybe in a little bit more close detail than I've done before, uh, just on the emphasis on suffering. But at the same time that Christ suffers, uh, suffered for us, and has, we have that model, that example that uh, he's with us, and this very strong sort of counterbalance of God's grace. So it's not all about suffering in the sense that it's just that's the end of it, but suffering and grace and glory and Christ appearing and uh, that those two together, we have the suffering that we, there's a realism about it, but there's not a despair. There's the hope. There's something that is going to be revealed and something that is already being revealed in his grace, empowering us and maturing us through, through those testings, testings that we may face. Well, that's our last session. Let's uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we, we're going to have the whole session up on YouTube for you to look at. If you missed any, you can go back. Let's close in prayer just briefly as, as we finish our time. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that, uh, for the encouragements of this whole letter and thank you for the promise of the great shepherd and his appearing. And we pray that you would help us to be faithful in this time to shepherd those who are under our care, whatever, however great or however little our responsibilities might be within your church, to see those we're among us your flock who uh, require your tender, loving direction and guidance um, to be prepared to suffer, to take encouragement um, and solidarity from those suffering across the world and to remember to pray for and support Christians who are suffering more than we are, much more than we are in many other places. And may we humble ourselves under your mighty hand, knowing that uh, you will lift us up and help us to cast our cares upon you in the anxieties and the concerns we may have, and particularly in this time of great uncertainty. So we thank you for all that you've revealed to us, continue to speak to us, we pray through this letter, and continue to shape us and form us that we may live out all that Peter is bringing to us uh, in his teaching. So we ask these things in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Philip. <laughs>